Welcome to the Creative Soul Healing Podcast. Here we talk about the connection between creativity and healing, and how we are creative, and how creativity helps us heal mentally, physically, and emotionally. Join us now. Hi everyone, Larissa Russell of Creative You Healing, and today I have with me Joshua Rodriguez. Joshua is a facilitator, educator, event host, and promoter, as well as a spiritual counselor. In one-on-one sessions, Joshua guides his clients towards self-acceptance, empowering them to gain control of and become active participants in their own lives. Drawing upon his own unique, hard-earned, transformative experiences, he has developed personalized methods of counseling geared geared towards catalyzing self-actualization. Over the past 12 years, this system has helped dozens to rid themselves of shame, see and embrace their identities as a whole, and live richer, better, materialized lives. I love that. Okay, welcome, Joshua. I can't wait Hi. to talk uh, about some of this. So for those who don't know you, can you just share a little bit of your story and the path that's brought you to where you are now? Yeah, let me start by apologizing about my camera. It goes in and out of focus. It's one of these high-speed things that we invest a lot of money in and it never works. Yeah. So <laughs> for anyone watching, I really apologize about that. It's like, dear Canon, I hope you catch up. Uh, so... <laughs> Let me uh, let me start by saying um, people come to me for space to self-actualize by speaking their truth in a way where they won't feel judgment and they can be empowered by being witnessed in their existence. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years. And the purpose behind it is I found my connection to a higher power, a higher purpose. I found a value in living and life that has been very fulfilling for me. Um, It's, it took me many years to uh, to come to the understanding that the journey that we're on is it gives us meaning, right? And not well beyond well beyond what society has taught us or conditioned us to, but more around feeling human connectedness. Give me one second. Let me adjust. There we go. A little less, a little more. Sorry about that. No, that's okay, because um, you faded completely away there. So. There we go. There oh, we go. there we go. <clears throat> um, so it it started off when I was in high school, right? People ask, well, what do you what do you want to do when you grow up? Right. And for me, it was, well, I want to help people. But that's such a big umbrella. What do we do with that? Right. And from there, I went, I joined the Marines. I'm, I grew up in New York City. And I followed in the footsteps of my, of my father. Right? He was a Vietnam vet. Uh, he was a fantastic role model um, for me. My parents grew up in a time where to be a successful parent meant to be a provider, right? And providing was greater than affection. Mm -hmm. And that left a void in my own life around what does intimacy and affection look like? Their absence of intimacy and affection, I don't judge them for this by any stretch of the imagination. They were only going off of what they were taught and what they knew to be the best choice. I sought that connection elsewhere, right? Being a Latino who grew up in New York City uh, in the 80s and the 90s, masculinity was defined by intimate partners. And I was determined to be a man, right? So I started having intimate relations at a very young age, at 12. Mm -hmm. To fill this feeling that I, I had missing in my body, it wasn't that. Right, it wasn't sex that that was missing, but it was affection, 
and closeness and vulnerability. But it took me many years to discover that because no one ever teaches us this stuff. Our parents are only going off of what they were taught. Their parents were only going off of what they were taught. At no point in life does anyone sit down on a, like a community level and say, listen, folks, everyone's winging life. No one knows what's going on. And we are here to be your guides, not your role models. <laughs> right? It's like it was very turbulent. Right to not have an understanding of identity, to not what know what connection felt like, to not know what communication is, because no one sits us down and teaches us how to share our feelings and thoughts. Right there's conformity, there's uh, indoctrination of the education system, but no one ever sits us down and asks us about feelings and thought processes and what it means to be vulnerable and to be a person of integrity. Right. Now, I learned all this through trial and error. I, I touched a lot of irons. I banged my heads on a lot of walls. Right? <laughs> and on the other side of it is changed behavior and acknowledgement of mistakes. Right? It doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in one light switch, but it's a consistency. And I was, am thankful that through my own life journey, through my relationship with my with intimacy and sex and, and letting that evolve, I found a connection to a higher purpose and a higher power. One would call it God through my own life journey of what it means to hold space without judgment. And it's brought me full circle around to Having walked the walk and having started talk the talk, my goal is to help others walk their walk, mm -hmm. right? While continuing to do the best that I can to, to maintain the integrity in, in, my, in my role that I play. Right, yeah. And it's amazing that, you know, like you said, like our parents don't, didn't know. And, and so we've had to figure this out. And hopefully, you know, generationally, like I see a difference in my kids and they're figuring a few more things out and, and hopefully their kids will figure a few more things out until we get healthier and healthier. That's the plan. Um, but we do need people <laughs> to step in because uh, we see the direction that a lot of our um, world is going. We do need people to step in and go, have you thought of doing it a different way? And that's the work that you do on a completely different level than how I do it. Um, but we're both doing the same thing, helping people step into their most authentic self, being their healthiest, wholest being to move through this world. And I think we often get judged on, you know, what is the right way or the wrong way to do things. And, you know, I, I'd like to share uh, just a, maybe a little bit about how you work with people, what like you talk about being, uh, you know, intimacy and things like that. Um, maybe we won't dive too deep, but you know, just a, a surface level of, of what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So ultimately, um, you know, when you look at the title of the work that I do from the outside, it has a very heavy connotation around whips and chains and all this crazy stuff. But at the core of it, right, if you remove all the action, and if you remove all the action of any of these modalities of therapy, and I'm going to go into therapy for a reason. What I do is I hold space for someone to tell me their deepest and darkest shames, fears, desires that they've never shared with anyone because I lead by example, right? I tell them, I like to give my own examples of what I had to work through so that they can feel equal in knowing that it was okay to not know yourself. It's okay to to speak it to someone who you feel safe with, right? Like one of the examples, one of the ideas I like to give in it as a listener, what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment and think about the person that you feel most safest with and most authentic with. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to be responsible for yourself in this point moving forward. I want every person that you introduce into your life, into your circle of vulnerability, to meet that bar like that person who allows you to feel the most safest and the most vulnerable. Because what happens in 
is in the space that is created, oftentimes I am that person of safety and vulnerability. And for the person that I'm with to be able to come out and say things that they've thought about, that they've had so much shame, usually built around religion, politics, um, culture, just to name a few, you're boxed into a normality of life as opposed to a natural expression, mm -hmm. right? And this is where the conflict of doing what's normal versus doing what's natural. There is no normal, right? We've been duped into thinking that there is a normal. Normal is convenience. Normal is societal pressure and conformity. But naturally, who are we deep down inside? I remove the normal. And I allow the natural to come to the surface because that's what midlife crisis is. That's what imposter syndrome can look like at times, right? Not doing what feels natural, but conforming to what's normal. And we hit a wall and our whole lives explode off of decisions we make because something isn't natural in our body, but we've boxed ourselves into the expression that's expected of us. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do through the work that I, I, I've been doing for a decade. That's what people come to me for is the ability to let go of the bags and the masks. And if it's just for our moment, how do we move forward and integrate it into our lives, steering towards authenticity a bit more regular? Because Understanding you can't just rip the Band-Aid off when it comes to trying to merge the two identities that are conflicting, right? Sometimes it has to be piecemeal. Sometimes you can't and you have to keep that divide because your, your normal life has been built so heavily on a foundation that if you move that foundation a little bit, everything would fall apart and that could break someone emotionally and psychologically. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a really good point is that it's not about like uh, one thing or another. It's about taking steps that will move you into your most authentic self. Right. And uh, I talk with my clients. I mostly deal with women. We most we, I use creativity as a, as a means to do that. But it's about uncovering and allowing ourselves to express ourselves, because when we when we hold all of that um, control or lack of control because we're busy conforming right we're 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 controlling ourselves from being our true self it it breaks us in a certain way and and that's not the word that i like but but i think about you know depression and anxiety and how that has increased so much because we're trying so hard to be something we're not and when we can allow that to let go right stop trying to control it so much we can let go and step into our most authentic self. It can be super scary. And so having someone who understands that, who can meet you and walk you through the steps of that is so important in whatever way that looks like. And there's going to be somebody different. Um, probably my clients, maybe some of them would overlap, but, you know, not most of them. So how I work with clients is different than how you work with clients, but we all need to be there to help people move into their most authentic self. And I bet you we have more crossover than I'm willing to give credit to. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if, if you peel away the sticker of the modality, if it's massage therapy, it's, if it's BDSM, if it's art therapy, if it's mental health, like therapist therapy, mm -hmm. the formula of the healing is the same. Mm -hmm. Allowing someone to exist in their truth without judgment, right? To be able to exist right our job is to witness someone not to change someone right i get to i have the luck of having been able to hammer out what these conversations look like so that i can ask you two or three questions to get to the root of your dilemma for yourself right because i don't have the answers i have the questions but you have the answers Right. Right. And, and coming back to that shame point, right? Because I think almost everything comes back to shame, right? Are we doing it the right way? Have we been told this is, 
you know, not acceptable? Have we, you know, all of those things. Are we allowing ourselves to step out of? And it, and it's shame that's been passed down because then we just pick up the ball and, and carry it with us. We take up, we don't even need other people to continue to shame us because we're going to do it for ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, we just pick up that ball and run. And so yeah. when we start to let go and yeah, yeah. So what, what are your thoughts about, about that? So I was having a conversation yesterday, a deep conversation around um, trauma and shame, right? Um, there's the acknowledgement of where we're stuck or what we've experienced. And a lot of people stop at the acknowledgement to say, well, I know it's happened, so that's good enough. And it's like, that's the beginning step of, right? People talk about processing and ask them, what, what, define, what, what is processing? Define processing. For me, processing is when I get to share my story or perspective or my experience from where I am today of an experience that happened in my past where I was in it. So I get to process it from a different viewpoint or perspective. So it doesn't have the same energy or weight or control it had over me. The purpose, the journey of understanding self requires a lot of processing. It starts with acknowledging of what we've experienced in our life, but it doesn't end there. We have to talk about how it made us feel. We have to talk about how it's made us change the actions that we've moved and learned from it. And how do we integrate not only the awareness and the knowledge, but the action and the outcome of it. How do we use our information, our past to steer our present towards our future? Um, that's what it, that's what this comes down to for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I know in, in working with my clients is, is that scariness of the unknown, right? So if I do this to step into my most authentic self, what will everybody else think? Which comes back to the shame. What will other people do? Like, what if I lose my family? What if I lose my friends? And you know what? You might. But that can be the cost of stepping into your most authentic self. Because what is it costing you? to not be your most authentic self. When I had mentioned about setting the bar, right, of how I get to be, for a lot of folks, I get to be the bar of authenticity, right? This is how I felt with them, um, sharing my information. If we never get to work with each other, think about that person, who is your bar, right? Because if we're not living like that, we're living under the rule and pressure of someone else's expectations but we don't see that until we see it, right? Those are one of those things that you have to learn through your own experiences and trial and error. Mm -hmm. Because authenticity is not cheap and it's not painless. <laughs> it, it, it costs a lot. Keeping in mind, if a person doesn't ex accept you as you are or as who you are as a person in a journey of self-discovery, how much access should they have to you anyway? And I personally am willing to go so far into, say, even blood family. I've separated myself from because while I love you, I also need to love me. And I can't subject myself to harm or, and it's not small negativity, but negativity to where it affects my headspace, my mental and spiritual well-being. I can't sacrifice that for my purpose and my peace of mind. Mm -hmm. And like, those are the hard conversations that we don't have, right? Or rarely get to have to acknowledge and say, you know what? Self-preservation is very important at this point. Step away from your to toxic X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Give yourself some breathing room and a perspective shift to say, maybe you can come back into it with a different angle and maybe they can see, but if not, no one's saying you have to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's any relationship, any relationship. And I think that's a really important one. And it's something that I talk about uh, with my clients. I'm quite open about. I don't um, engage with most of my family. And, and if you look at the mental health issues through our family, uh, my family in particular, um, you know, 
I, I can only do so much to present myself in a way that they um, can engage with. In, and, and if they won't, I have to at some point protect myself, right? And so um, I, I've found that it, it causes me less distress than it does for them. But they're not willing to change their, um, the way they move in the world around me. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to change who you are. But I'm not willing to be treated poorly because. But just respect me. Yeah. Just accept accept me as I am. Uh, so when you hear professional domination, right? You hear mistress, master, whips and chains, and I, I found my connection to God through this journey of self acceptance, self identity, being able to hold space and witness others in their own journey and uh, self awareness. If you don't know what I do you're going to judge what I do. And that's what happened with my family. Mm -hmm. And for them to have judged me for the work that I do, it was painful, right? Because they disregarded me with it. And what they don't realize is the interpretation of the work that I do is in essence, God's work. Meaning, my sole purpose is to hold space for an individual so that they can speak their truth and not feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. To tell them you're okay and you're not broken so that they don't have to walk around feeling bad for the person that they are. There is nothing more grounding, there's nothing more validating than being told and being able to tell someone. You're okay just the way you are. Mm -hmm. If that isn't the work of what God, Jesus, Muhammad, any sect has told us to, to our role here on this planet is, is to just hold space for people and accept, witness their existence. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to say I consider myself a spiritual and religious person. Karma and leather is my religion. And by that, I mean, I define religion as how I engage with others through my belief system. Mm -hmm. Whatever faith I want to put in there is choice. If it's Christianity, Catholicism, whatever it is, faith is choice. The engagement of how I treat other people through my belief system is the action of religion, religious practice. Spirituality is how I treat myself through my belief system, right? External and internal. The leather lifestyle is based on, fundamentally, is based on open communication, integrity, respect, equality, trust, right? There's, just like every other religious practice out there, leather has a practice and an expectation of behavior that I fundamentally believe in, and I, and I built all of my relationships based off of this practice. When you peel all the layers back, I personally believe the purpose of the human existence experience is to find the needles in the haystack. We have 8 billion people on this planet. We're not here to connect with everyone, but we're here to connect with those few that have the same build, character, morals, drive, purpose to build great things with. Tribe. Community is a different beast. But to find tribe and to find people who are chosen family is, is how I found it through this journey of identity here. Just like anyone else would through their own journey of life and higher power purpose, however we would want to frame it. They're just different skins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love, I love what you, you said about um, holding that, you know, the person that you basically trust the most, right. And, and holding that as your, as your bar, because I think if we hold the bar at, at our own level, right. So the per we treat ourselves so poorly, typically, that if we hold the bar at our level, it's just going to keep dropping. 
because as we beat ourselves up, that bar just keeps dropping. So to find that one person that you can connect with that you can hold the bar up to and then don't let anybody else slide underneath that. I think it's so I've important. I've never thought about it that way. I've, I've never thought about that because one of the things that I've recently talked about uh, and heard had conversation around is the phrase self-love. And self-love is, it's like uh, self-care thrown all over the place. If you change if you change the word self-love to self-hate mm -hmm. and sit with that value. Now, what does self-love look like? Taking your vitamins, brushing your teeth, showering, blah, blah, blah. If you miss a day, it's okay. Self-hate doesn't give that much forgiveness. Self-hate makes you look at the things that you are doing to yourself that are detracting from your best potential. Mm -hmm. Drinking, alcohol, diet, practice, routine, anything that you're taking, you, you are not, you are actively not doing the best possible thing you can for yourself. That's a whole different lens to look through mm -hmm. because it makes you really take a seat back and be, be a little responsible for the things you aren't doing for yourself, right? Like the medication you're supposed to take daily or the checkups or the drinking of the water or the choosing of the partners, right? Like this mounts up really quick. And it's crazy how we choose the extremes that we decide to choose. Self-love as opposed to self-hate, self-care, right? Things we don't want to really look at. And this is, this is brand new to me, maybe not even a week old of trying to integrate a new perspective so I can do the best I, I can possibly do for myself because th those are hard words to work around. Hate, no one wants to walk or talk around that. But if you have a pet, you will make sure your, your pup had the medication every day. You make sure it was going out on a walk and losing those three pounds that it needed to. Why are we detracting it from ourselves? Right? And this is that part of integrity that matters that we don't look at. A lot of people look at truth outward, religiously truth, but not spiritually. Right. Where's the truth in here? Yeah, yeah, and and that's exactly it, right? Because we do look at ourselves through that lens of self-loathing, self, you know, self-hate, um, but we then uh, even turn that on ourselves, like we're supposed to be loving ourselves, and so it's like we're not doing that right. And so, how do we love ourselves if you know we can't even we can't even get that part right? You know, and it's not about getting it right. It's because no one even taught us. Mm -hmm. We're too busy being conformed to fit in like everyone else. We're not taking for, like, for example, me in high school, I sucked at math because the teacher, and this, this is a pattern, a consistent pattern. I saw it when it happened. Going to school here in, the, in New York City, you have a melting pot of different education, different ways to teach, different experiences, different teachers. Every math teacher I got from junior high school forward was Ghanese. And the way they were taught on how to teach math was the same way. And I could not pick it up at all. And I would get frustrated and angry to where I would scratch myself in the back from frustration. I've never, it's never dawned on me until this moment. The frustration that I would have sitting because I couldn't grasp what they were saying. And I was so frustrated. But at no point did anyone ask, What's wrong? I was just a failure in math because I wasn't paying attention. Right now, there's no justice in that. There's no... You beat yourself up because you failed for X amount. And I've carried that into my 20s when I tried to go back to school. And the same, not the same teacher, but it was, it was a Ghanese teacher teaching the same way. And I told him, I said, listen, I can't do this with the way you're teaching. And they shut me down. I had to drop the class and I couldn't move fat forward because I couldn't pass this block. And, you know, sitting on this side of it, it's like, I'll run circles around all of you professors around things that I'm experienced in, but I'm not asking you to do algebra backwards, right? It's like, <laughs> it was really painful and invalidating because we're too busy being told to conform and we're being told we're wrong when we can't. And it's extremely frustrating, extremely valid, invalidating. Um, and imagine that's just math. What about 
inner turmoil? <laughs> what about existential stuff? What about the way we hear things? I just learned from my partner a couple of weeks ago that they have to hear things three times before their brain actually processes it. And they they carry too much shame to admit that. They're 57. They just admitted that weeks ago. Because mm -hmm. no one ever gives us the space to exist as we are because we're too busy trying to hit a benchmark of what's normal. And there is no normal. And that's that's the that's like the red herring. Is it's that like there is no normal? We all strive for something that doesn't even exist. It doesn't even exist. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I was I was 50 years old when I was um, diagnosed with autism. And it just all the things in my life started to make sense because I had never been accepted for who I was by my family, by anyone else. And, you know, I could make myself fit in, but I was not being my most authentic self to do that. Up. Right. Put on the mask. And, uh, and it just about like killed me, right? The depression got so bad, it almost took my life. And it was when I decided to no longer do that, to no longer try so hard, you know, I learned so much more about myself and also was able to then move forward in my life. And yes, did I have to leave a lot of people behind? Yes. Did I have a lot of work, a lot of painful work, you know, taking ownership of what was mine, but letting go of what wasn't. And that was a much bigger piece than what was mine, right? Because we take everything on ourselves and we feel responsible for how other people treat us. And we are in the fact that, you know, it's up to us how we let people treat us, but people treating us poorly is because they don't respect us, not because we're not respectable or not, you know, worth respect. I, uh, I was in a similar situation around the depression and the dark thoughts, right? Because there's not one person I know ever that has never thought about suicide or ending it. There's, that's a discussion no one has. Everyone pretends like it's something to be shameful about. Life is no joke. Right, what we experience and this fear and the invalidations and and the the victories, life is no joke. I remember when I realized that everyone was winging it. Right, this was in my twenties. Here's another thing: maturity. Right, you're an adult at eighteen. Mm, not from my experience. Right, I didn't hit adulthood until my thirties. I realized in my 20s that everyone, and I, I worked for federal law enforcement, right? We got badges and guns and transporting prisoners and judges and all this. And it's like, I asked a supervisor a question once and he looked at me dumbfounded. And in that response, I realized he has no clue about what's going on in reality. I thought I was the only one. And when I realized everyone was winging it, I was like, we have a problem <laughs> because if everyone's winging it, who taught us? Who taught them? Who taught this person how to be a leader? Who taught this person how to be a parent? Who taught this? It's like everything started to make sense. Uh, the same around autism and mental mental awareness, mental health. Mental awareness. I, I, even, I can't even call it mental health much anymore because it's not. No one's broken. And I've been sitting with this for days. I mean, to the extremes of schizophrenia and anything, things that require medication, I understand that. I understand the need for some of that. But a lot of people aren't broken. It's the way they process. How about we learn the different ways of people processing and adapt our society to all the different ways? ADHD is something that I been projected to me numerous times and I've yet to stop to look at it to compare how who I am to the spectrums of different learning and it keeps falling into my lap and it's like I'm not broken I'm different you're not broken you're different you're not broken you're different I, I one of my uh, slave married uh, she is We've been in a relationship for over two years. Uh, she's disabled. And she started an in initiative called Kink Abilities, which has transformed to Unmasked. And 
what we're doing is we're interviewing other folks who are disabled with visible or invisible disabilities. And we're sitting there and listening and talking with, to them about their life experiences. And what does it mean to have desire as a disabled person? What does it mean to have curiosities as a disabled person? I put it in quotes because the more I listen to them, the smaller the pool of folks who are not disabled. But I don't believe in it anymore to a degree that there is anything such as someone who isn't disabled. I, I've, I'm coming into an, a space of different abilities right now. Some detract and some give and some are a lot more difficult than others to navigate. But it doesn't mean that their human experience is any less of a value to, to our existence. One person's experience in life emotionally and physically, spiritually, to how they're giving and how they're received, no one person is greater than the other. I mean, I saw an, an article of a woman who had to drag herself down the aisle on an airplane because it's not mandatory that they have aisle wheelchairs for airplanes. What does that, as a person who says they're spiritual and tr trying to be a good person, how can someone sit there and look at this article and move past it? What are we doing in our human experience? Right, this, is, this is where I've come through my own journey of trying to understand my own identity. Uh, it happened to come through the avenue of leather and BDSM. But when you remove the skin of all of it, it's around humanity. And what are, what are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. And that, it, that is such a good point because uh, often our judgment gets in the way, right, of um, connection because we judge people based on their, um, their look or their um, outward. We don't see the whole person is what I'm trying to say. We don't see the whole person and or something that we may feel shame about. <clears throat> so then we judge others because we feel shame, right? We've been, been taught it's shameful to even talk about sex or to um, admit as a woman that we might enjoy sex, right? Um, I mean, and that's really low level compared to- And, like, and the, imagine if- you could tell your partner, right, as a, as a female-bodied person talking to a male-bodied person, I like sex differently. Ah, oh, because oh, now ego is involved into this, right? Like, we all have desires. My purpose in life is to help folks accept themselves sexually, to, the, to help folks know that they're not broken. It wasn't until last year I gave myself permission to explore my own body. Mm -hmm. So by all means, please don't let me sound holier than now, because I'm still giving myself permissions. I'm still on my own journey trying to figure this out. It's like there's, there's so much to learn about ourselves. There's so much to forgive ourselves for. There's so much to give ourselves permission for. Right. There's no, you're not late to the party. You're not too late to be a sexual person. You're not too late to be a person of curiosity. I mean, I work with people in their 70s and their 80s. There is no such thing as too late. Mm -hmm. But there is a thing as give yourself permission. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, if, and if it's something that you want to explore, give yourself permission to do that. Yeah. Even if you've been told, that it's bad, it's shameful, it's dirty, whatever the things that you've been told. And that's anything. That's, that's beyond mm -hmm. sex. Yeah. That's beyond intimacy. That's just your human existence. And what is it that makes you feel full? What, does, what makes you feel larger? I work with a, a priest. He's been a priest for 40 years. And I was three when he started his priesthood. Mm -hmm. And through him, I've we've had some really deep conversations around spirituality and religion. And when him and I worked for the first time, 
at the end of our session, he carried a lot of shame around who he was as a man. And I had to walk him through his faith and connection to God because <clears throat> he was putting his career before his humanity. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what would God think of me as a priest? And I, I asked him, I said, well, what does God want of you as a man? Because you're a man before you're a priest. You're a person before you're anything else. You have a soul. What does he want from you? And he said, well, whatever makes me feel full, large, whatever makes me feel like I've given and I've received. And it's like, well, did you feel that? And he was like, yes. I said, so you're, walk, you're, you're, you're walking the walk. You're showing God that you were living your human experience. We both gained and grew from that experience and we, we both walked away from it feeling more complete, right? I provided you the space to share and to unfold and to self-actualize and you followed through. What else does God want from you? Mm -hmm. What else is the point of our experience, of our life existence? And it, 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 to me, it feels like that. It, it means connecting with someone, holding space for each other, speaking our truth, witnessing our existence, sharing life experiences together, and then reflecting on the joy that we share. Yeah. And, you know, as you, as you were just, you know, saying that, you know, about, you know, that's what connection is and that's what stepping into, I'm like, yeah, those are all the things I do. I do, I do it in a different way, right? I hold space for people. I give them space to, you know, figure things out and allow them to move into their space. I, you know, uh, we can, um, uh, you know, be celebratory about the, the, the steps that they've taken and we can enjoy each other's company and we just do it in a completely different way but it's still the, the same thing. We're still it's moving shared in. experience. It's yeah. just shared, shared life experience. Like that's what, I'm the most vanilla guy you will ever meet because <laughs> my modality is just that it's the modality to helping people feel pure in, in a form that we're born in sexuality, identity beyond that. It, I, it has nothing to do with what I desire in connection with a person. Right. I want to have conversations like this. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to talk about purpose. I want to talk about science. I want to talk about space and aliens. Right. I, there's so much greater ways to connect that isn't physical. The physicality, though, for me and how I believe what this human experience is, is we're in this flesh so that our souls can have a place to meet physically. Mm -hmm. So that we can find the needles in the haystack who we were here to meet and we can hug, we can embrace, we can hold hands, we can go have amazing meals, we can have conversations like this. That's the whole human experience for me is to be able to meet the souls that we know outside of here in person so I can touch you and I can hold your face and say, oh my God, you're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. And and that is the intimate moments, right? Yeah. When, when we think Those about are. it, it's that connection. Those are the intimate moments. And we have, in our culture, put so much shame around intimacy that we don't even allow intimate moments in conversation or um, in sharing of parts of ourselves, uh, our story. We don't allow that because we have um, shamed intimacy at any level. And that doesn't have to just include, you know, a sexual intimacy, right? <clears throat> what I get, what I'm thankful for that I get to share, because my, my work doesn't involve sexual intercourse. It involves intimacy. Sometimes it's sexually charged, meaning there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of energy exchange closeness, but it's not penetrate. What I want you to feel when you're with me is I want you to feel safe. I want you to feel seen and heard. I want you to feel the delicacy of a touch and vulnerability to where you can laugh, you can cry, you can scream, you can shake. 
without being worried about what am I going to think about you responding to my touch? Because mm-hmm. something as simple as a hand holding or stroking of the hair or the scalp, right? Massaging of the hands to say, I can feel your weariness. I can feel your, the absence of touch, right? Because this, this is what it's about, being able to, to caress someone and say, I've got you, right? You can lay your head in my lap and cry. You can say how frustrating life is. Yeah, yeah. That, um, yeah, I mean, that's ultimately what we all want is that connection, right? So finding, finding the person to, to help guide you, um, that's what I consider myself a guide. And so guide the, <laughs> the only difference is I'm about, if we're climbing a mountain, I'm about three feet, four feet in front of you. And I know the next loose rock. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I don't know what the top of that shit looks like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Cause we're, we're experiencing this whole human existence as well. And so, um, you know, I have my own doubts. I have my own shames that I work through. I have my own, you know, um, I just maybe work through them a little faster when they pop up for me because I have the tools in my toolkit to do yes. that and have, I've worked really hard to have those tools in my toolkit. Yes. So. Because we have to touch the iron. Some of them, we, some <laughs> like, I like to equate it to looking for the light switch in a dark room with my forehead. <laughs> It's not here, right? And it's like a lot of a lot of that. And you're not alone. A lot of us look for the light switches with our foreheads until we realize we have hands to do it. <laughs> I, I always call it being hit upside the head with a two by four by, <laughs> by uh, God, spirit, universe, whatever you want to call it, because I seem to always require that to make change. So yes, I'm learning yes. <laughs> that hurts and I need to, you know, pay attention. And when I see the two by four, maybe I could start making some change. <laughs> and and that's, and, and that's fact, right? Maybe, right? Cause maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> we'll see how I'm it goes today. It. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I, I've loved our conversation, but one question that I ask all my guests is what does healing with creativity mean to you? And it's going to be different for everyone because creativity is in everything. Healing with creativity. Um, I think healing with creativity for me revolves around fluidity. Um, Healing through creativity. So for me, the process of healing is acknowledgement and then integration, right? Changed behavior is healing. Versatility in conversations and expectations I'm going to use the word expectations because I can't think of a better word at the moment. Allows us to to be dynamic in the process of getting to the goal, right? Because the goal is from point A to point B. How we get there, I don't care. As long as we get to point B. Then point B is the integration of, of the lesson. Ch- change behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think when we can look at healing in different ways, when we can look at creativity in different ways, that's really important. You know, most people think creativity is, is the, you know, painting a painting or writing a book or, you know, playing in a symphony. Creativity is literally in everything that we do. And it is what makes us who we are because we're creative beings and allowing that space to uh, take your journey of healing in whatever way that looks for you, like for you is part of that creativity is my thoughts on it. And, um, and I'm just gonna share, cause we, we left this part out of the bio. Um, <laughs> you may have caught on by now um, that uh, Master Joshua is a professional dominant, which is the male equivalent of a dominatrix. And so that is the work that you do, but ultimately it's that healing work 
that when you're working with people to step into authenticity. And one of the reasons we left that off the bio at the beginning is that shame and judgment part um, that comes with, um, I'm not even going to listen to this. There's nothing that, and I think we've had just the most amazing conversation about humanity, about healing, about our personal journeys. <clears throat> and so allowing ourselves that space to maybe listen to things that we, we might not completely understand without judgment up front. I'm just going to challenge, challenge my listeners with that one. I, I, re I really appreciate that, Larissa. What I, I would even go a, further, a step further, and I would offer a 30-minute conversation with anyone that has heard this and has more questions about what it is that this is all about. Um, because I believe the journey of understanding identity specifically, and I, I equate sexual identity with identity, period, to have a conversation about self. Once that door is open, there's a validation and an affirmation that comes with it that is life-changing, shifts perspective. Does any listeners, wh whether you agreed with what we were talking about or not, or you're curious or not, you just want to touch base and share ideas, reach out to me. And I'm more than happy to have this conversation because I believe if we can get in touch with our identity at the root, everything will fall into place. But the, the conversation that we have with ourselves through the ability to be honest is the game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, Joshua, for being here today. And I just, I think our conversation, I, I, I loved it. I hope people are going to listen to it and, and uh, not get caught up in the labels and just actually listen to the message. I really, really do hope so for their sake. It, it means nothing to me if, if you don't. Um, but for your own sake, I hope that you can, you know, listen to um, what was said today with an open heart. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for being here, Joshua. The pleasure is all mine. And I believe that most everyone will, uh, because if you, this is the space that you're curating, that you're creating, and the safety and the ability that you have, that you've given me to share, I think most, if not every one of your listeners is here ready to to receive like that. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Well, thank you so much. To our listeners, we will see you again next time. And in the meantime, I wish for you amazingly creative days. Thank you for listening. If you found our podcast of interest, we'd love for you to leave a review wherever you listen in.